Okay, so today we have a Wills Gardner K7500. Uh, I was sent two of these by the same person. This will be number one, next video will be number two. And I don't, there wasn't any actual paperwork in there defining, in the box I mean, defining which of the two had which problem. Um, let's see here. I'm not prepared here. I forgot to get my phone to see what they had messaged me about the issue. Let's see here. Uh, one of them would slowly fade into vertical collapse. It would start out normal and then start to flash a bit. Then the image would shrink down till it was fully collapsed. And then the other one had a bad red transistor on the neck board, maybe. Uh, not sure what else. So one of them apparently works but has a red, a bad red transistor, or missing red, if you will. And the other one apparently collapses into vertical collapse over time. So, yeah, I don't know which one of these it will be that we're opening up first. So let's just take a look. Either one shouldn't pose too big of a problem. I'm interested to see if they're a 27 or 25 inch. And 27. And we can tell that by looking. We've already done a video on the fact that a 25 will work on a 27 and vice versa. So you can interchange the 27 and 25 chassis on the 25, 27 inch tube. We've already talked about that. But just so you can identify which ones are which, on the neck board there is an ID tag here. You can see uh, Wills Gardner monitors 27 inch 7500. So this is a 27 inch 7500. So I'm interested if they're both going to be if they're both going to be 27, I don't know. While we're here, let's wipe our uh, pots back and forth a bunch of times and preset them to about 25%. Because I've mentioned before, that this series of chassis does not like to be any higher. Oh well, red was red's all the way down. Red is completely down all the way. Well that may be this may be the one that's missing red and it was simply uh, a bad or improperly set uh, bias pot. It doesn't bode well that the red was turned all the way down but that may have been the issue. And these I'll put about 50% All right, uh, let's inspect the neck board here real quick. And other than the usual, well, these are secure. These are secure, but they're all bent out of whack. Not uncommon. And I gotta say, this is a low hour. If you if you bend these manually, you want to pull up. You want to pull up as you as you move them around, because if you push down, you'll pop the solder the solder pads off the traces. So lift up as you try and reposition these and you'll kind of prevent damage to the pads. Okay, that seems all right. Let's move these transistors away from the heat sinks. Man, right. that's not bad. Reposition these. Uh, caps are original, so we're, we're gonna have to put a cap kit on this, but Okay, that's about all we need to do for now on the neck board. Let's open up the rest of this and check out, check the main chassis out here. Ah, well, looks like I should have uh, opened it up first because as we see on the bottom, uh, works for five to ten minutes then pulsates and collapses well that sounds like caps to me and why I say that is because the capacitor will will store a charge it will enter it will energize through voltage and hold a charge and then if it's not able to hold that charge it'll dissipate and dissipate and dissipate and then it'll end up with various things like that so that sounds to me like a classic capacitor issue um, so I guess what we'll do is we'll inspect it 
If nothing is immediately amiss, we'll turn it, we'll put it on a tube and test it and watch and count and see how long it takes to do what it's being described as doing. Then we'll cap it and reflow it and do all the normal work to it and then time it again and see if it ever happens again. So we'll go off of that as a game plan here. Man, this thing looks spotless. It's obviously had some hours on it because it's a little dirty on the uh, flyback, but the cable is relatively clean. There's not a bunch of soot on the cable. Uh, the chassis is clean. The transistor area is not all burned up. This is a relatively low hour 7500. Nice they included the, the remote board. Almost nobody does that. Um, oh, well, there's your problem, number one. What did I say? <laughs> what did I say? Bad caps, look at this. Look at that. Yikes. That is out there. Bulge City. We got, uh, we got the John Holmes. Of capacitors right there <laughs> man that is sticking out there well yeah like I said bad capacitors so I'm not even sure if there's any real reason I don't really even kind of want to honestly power this up with this capacitor like that because we already know what's happening I don't really want to even power it up with that capacitor like that so I think what we'll do is we'll just do our normal inspection uh, reflow and we'll do our cap kit and then We'll turn it on and test it and make sure that it will let it run for a good hour, two hours, make sure nothing happens and barring any unforeseen circumstance, we'll call it fixed. But um, if it is working other than this problem or the collapse problem, I think that's probably going to be all we have to do to this. So let's take a look at the back side. Now the problem is, is that did this fail just because of over time? Because it just simply failed or because something else caused it to fail? So that, therein lies the question. But uh, given that most of the caps on this from the factory are junk, uh, I would say that uh, probably just simply failed. But it does look like someone has replaced this capacitor and this capacitor alone. Looking at this, you can clearly see somebody has replaced this capacitor. There's no glue on there. Uh, and it's incorrectly. It's installed correctly. The stripe is the negative and we've got the black as the negative. But I don't see any evidence of any other caps being changed out. Uh, well, no, I take that back. This one's been changed. Uh, but I don't see any others right offhand. Uh, this, this did not use Nichicon caps from the factory, and that's what this one is, and that's what this one is. So it looks like... Oh, and they changed this one too, right there. So three caps? Only, why would they change three capacitors? Maybe somebody was trying to troubleshoot some stuff, I don't know, but... We'll take a look, we'll do our testing for collapse problems, we'll do our cap kit, we'll do our reflow, and uh, then we'll test it. But let's take this off of here. Number one, alright. You are my number one. A guy. Uh, um, da, 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 da. Our AC input headers have not been reflowed, so that'll need to be done. Almost every one of these you ever come across are going to have cracked joints. So if you have one that's totally, completely dead, always check to make sure your AC input headers aren't cracked. Because that's a, one of the most common things to, to look at. And I don't really see anything else. This looks completely untouched except for those caps that got changed out. And somebody, oh, I missed one. This one here has been changed out. The 33, the 33 ohm, I'm sorry, 33 uh, microfarad. Okay, anyway, so what I was saying was is this cap has been changed because if we look at the back side here, you can see somebody just bent the legs over instead of clipping them off. I mean, that's not a big deal, but 
you want to make sure you clip those off properly. Uh, but I'm 100% positive that it's probably just solder joints and this cap right here that is the problem. So, that being said, let's uh, actually, while I'm doing this here, where'd my screwdriver go? Our subcontrast pot. We'll put our subcontrast pot, we'll wipe it back and forth, and we'll put it right in the middle. Uh, horizontal hole sitting there. That's all the way to the right. Seems a bit excessive, but not going to worry about it. Q703 is intact. Uh, okay. Well, let's go ahead and test some components here. Just for the sake of testing. All right, for this is for collapse anyway here. R303 should be 1.2 ohms. That's this guy here. Close enough, 1.3. D302. Uh, 0.44, that's good. Does it read the opposite? I think it reads both ways. Yeah, in circuit it reads both ways. But you'll see how it climbs up higher than 0.44, so it's good. Uh, so those components are okay. D603 is this guy in here. You want to make sure it does not read both ways. And that's correct for one direction and the other direction does not. So our uh, vertical IC in theory should be okay. Those are the three main components you want to check when you have collapse issues. So. Yeah, given that it starts out okay and then shrinks over time, I knew it was a capacitor problem, and sure enough, bada bing. So, what I'm going to do here is, I guess, uh, in the interest of not having a 10-minute video, uh, I'm sure some of you like the shorter ones and other ones like the longer ones. So, somewhere in the intermediate here, let's uh, do a time lapse of a full cap kit and uh, a full reflow, and then we'll get it on the tube and test it out. And I'm assuming it'll be good. So here we go. Okay, so I want to mention something here. Uh, the full cap kit's now complete on the main board and the neck board, but I want to mention something before I start doing the reflow and kind of um, time lapsing that part of it is that it, I want to give you an example of why it's important to not just do the cap kit and then be done. You want to do a very good inspection and a very good reflow of anything that might need 
reflow. And if we look here, here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is the focus pin. This is the focus section for the neck connector. And if you look here, can I get much closer than that? Uh, not really. Look at look at this. Uh, this is something that almost always needs reflowed, and it's just not in very good shape. It's hard to see with the reflection, but this is a joint that needs to be reflowed. Very important. Uh, the rest of this stuff, like your it's all your uh, bias pots and color pots, those need to get reflowed. And your connections here, the header pins for the connector for your cable that runs down to the main board that connects the neck board to the, the main board. That needs reflowed on the neck board and the main board. You need to reflow all the header pins for your remote board because every time it gets plugged and unplugged, you can crack a joint. So that needs reflowed. Your uh, power connector needs reflowed. The header pins for this that I mentioned before. Just some important areas you want to ver visually verify and reflow some key areas on both the, the boards here. And of course, as we all know, the heat sinks are not very good on these neck boards. And what they'll do is they will not allow enough heat transfer and it will cook the board. And as you can see, it's been discolored, but this is a very, this is a, a not as severe of burning as a lot of these neck boards encounter. We can even see that we really don't have any lifted tra traces or damaged pads. So this is a somewhat low hour 7500. I was able to flatten all these out, get them nice and aligned, get these separated out. There's no, they're not touching the components. And we can simply just remove the old solder from these joints and flow new solder. That's what reflow is. I mentioned before that when I say reflow, reflow isn't really adding new solder. You want to remove the old solder and put new solder on after inspecting the pads. That's what reflow means. So it gets thrown around rather loosely, but for a lot of stuff we can simply, like you can just simply add new solder to the, the pots and things like that, but for anything that's subjected to heat like this, you want to remove the original solder, inspect the pads, and if they're okay, then flow new solder on. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do our reflow on the neck board, then we're going to go through and do our reflow on the main chassis, and then we'll hook it up and see what happens. So let's cue the time lapse and we'll get that done and then we'll see where we're at. Well, and just like that, we're all ready to go. We have full reflow, everything that needs it. We got full cap kit, everything done to the neck board that needs done. Everything is hooked back up, ready for testing. So let's grab a picture tube, hook it up, turn it on, 
cross our fingers and see what kind of issues we have. If it's working fine out of the gate, we'll let it run and I'll do a time lapse of 15, 20, 30 minutes. Make sure it doesn't start collapsing. Make sure nothing goes haywire and assuming that it doesn't, uh, we'll call it good. I'll have to make some adjustments, make sure we can make it look as good as we can. Verify our flyback doesn't uh, get brighter or darker or focus or out of focus the longer it's on. Because if it is, if it does, then we'll have to replace it. But unfortunately, they don't have any of these at the moment. Everybody's out of stock, and the ones that are available are junk. So if it needs a flyback, then I can at least send it back to the owner in a working condition. He'll have to change it out himself later. Uh, that's the only real option at this point. But let's get it all hooked back up and see what happens. All right, so we're all hooked up, ready to go. We got anode, neck, yoke, ground, power, video, and remote. Uh, I'm running an actual, I'm going to run an actual Cruise on USA board because I like to use an actual PCB whenever necessary. Uh, I just use the test pattern generator when it's convenient. But when I'm, when I'm actually testing, when I'm actually testing a, uh, a setup like this where I want to get an accurate portrayal of what it looks like, I like to use an actual PCB. So we'll use a Cruise on USA board. Uh, I have the width transistor hooked up properly so we'll have proper width control uh, if this works the way it's supposed to. And of course, video connected, and my uh, remote board is hanging off the edge of the test bench here because there's no proper uh, protector here, so I have to let it hang off the side. So that should be it. Uh, we're hoping that it powers up. We're hoping that it doesn't have collapse immediately. We're hoping it doesn't go into collapse. And I have the tripod set up, so once we turn this on, if everything works, we're going to set it up on the tripod and do a time lapse to see how long it takes for it to collapse, and hopefully it doesn't collapse at all. I'm pretty sure, like I mentioned, that uh, I suspected originally it had bad caps, and sure enough, we found at least one bulging cap. The rest of them weren't leaking from what I could tell, but there were some other strategic ones replaced, so who knows? All right, enough uh, ado here. Let's go ahead and turn it on and see what happens here. One, two, three. Okay, it comes to life. No immediate explosions. Uh, okay. We got... Uh, horizontal hold and I am using the proper 27 inch tube so we need to adjust our horizontal hold which is this pot right here so let's see if we can make that hey hey ah, damn it we're upside down okay well let's it is working how about that let's go ahead and shut it down and I need to flip the blue and red wires, or blue and red connector. No, not blue and red, I'm sorry. Blue and red horizontal. I need to flip the green and yellow. Now let's see what that does. Come on. Any day now. There we go. Hey, now we're in business. Okay. Uh, let's turn brightness and contrast all the way down. Uh, well, that's okay. I was going to adjust the I was going to adjust the flyback, but that seems to be okay. Let me kill the light. Uh, okay, let's do brightness to roughly there. Contrast roughly there. Uh, each position. Well, we're way too wide. Holy cow. Um, width control is good. Vertical size. There you go. Full square image. Colors look pretty damn good right out of the gate. That's why I like to set these to about 25% to start with. Uh, all, the co all of the color pots are 25%. Uh, the, uh, the bias pots are 25%. The uh, gains are 50%. Uh, and the subcontrast pot is at 50%. So those are the nominal positions I like to start with. Uh, it is out of focus a bit. Let's adjust our focus. I gotta wait till there we go. Ah, nice. Awesome, look at that. Beautiful picture. Crisp, 
in focus, great colors, fantastic. So good example if you do a lot of pre-work and uh, get everything going and do all the necessary stuff prior to turning it on and testing. If nothing has failed, you should end up with a good result like this. So I'll leave this run for about 30 minutes or so and verify that we don't have any kind of image uh, problems or collapse or jitteriness or flakiness or if it starts to get out of focus or if it starts to get too bright. And we'll see what happens. So cue the time lapse. Okay, so it has been 30 minutes and the image is considerably brighter. Now, I don't, it has not lost focus. We don't have raster lines. We have not lost focus. Focus has been locked in the entire time, but as you can see, it's clearly much brighter than it was when I first started. However, I'm not going to attribute that to the flyback being bad because I don't have raster lines. The, if the flyback was drifting up in brightness or down in brightness, you would see the raster lines appear as it got brighter, and I don't see raster lines. I think the reason it's gotten brighter is because this is the first time that I've used this picture tube in probably six months or more. It's just been sitting downstairs waiting to use, waiting, waiting for testing on a 27-inch 7500. So it's been a, quite a while that I have used this tube, so I think it just needed time to warm up. So now that it has warmed up, I'm going to turn the brightness back down. I have to wait for a black lead up. There we go. Let's turn the brightness back down to roughly there. Okay. And uh, still, the background is not black still. So let's turn our flyback back down until our black level is where we want it to be. Uh, I need to turn my light on here. Hang on. Okay, and where did my driver go? It's over here, of course. Um, okay, let's turn this back down. Let's put it there. And turn our light back off. Okay, that's a much better range right there, all right. Yeah, I do not think the flyback is the problem. I think it just needed time to warm up the picture tube. And now that it's warmed up, we can adjust it. 
And let's just crack. Well, I can't. If I go in the menu, I can't escape out of the menu. So, ah, there we go. Okay, there we go. Perfect. That is perfect. The background is black, and it's all good to go. We and we we did not. The focus did not drift. So I do not. I am 99.9% .9 sure the flyback is fine. I think it just needed time for the picture tube to warm up. So given that, I'm going to call this a success. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually probably just turn this off for half an hour and turn it back on. And if it's back at this level after about two minutes, I'm going to say it just needed to warm up the picture tube. So, uh, But for the sake of not having a super long video, I'm just going to do that off camera. But uh, again, if the flyback was bad, as the brightness increased, you would get the raster lines. I did not get the raster lines. So I'm very confident that it's not a flyback problem. It's just a picture tube needing to warm up issue. Okay, so that being said, this was a successful repair. Uh, just needed reflow, normal rebuild, and uh, new capacitors. So thanks for watching. Stay tuned for uh, 7500 number two for the same person. And hopefully it uh, turns out as well as this. So thanks for watching. Like, share, and subscribe. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.